By the end of 1863, with the Confederate Army lacking resources, funds, and manpower, it had become clear to Confederate General Patrick Cleburne that the South desperately needed to find a way to recruit new soldiers for the rebel cause. Calling it, quote, a plan which we believe will save our country, in January 1864 he called upon the leaders of the Army of the Tennessee and proposed the emancipation of slaves in order to enlist them in the Confederate war effort. He was likely aware that many escaped slaves had been fighting in the Union Army with honor and distinction, and wondered why they couldn't do the same for the Confederacy. He believed his plan would give the South a larger army than the North, and enable them to take the offensive in attacking the enemy. He also claimed that it would instantly remove all the vulnerability, embarrassment, and inherent weakness which results from slavery. There would be no recruits awaiting the enemy with open arms. No complete history of every neighborhood with ready guides. No fear of insurrection in the rear or anxieties for the fate of loved ones when our armies moved forward. The chronic irritation of hope deferred would be joyfully ended with the Negro, and the sympathies of his whole race would be due to his native South. Though about a dozen of his fellow officers endorsed the proposal, the idea was met with silent disinterest on the parts of his companions. Perhaps the most striking part of his declaration was his candid recognition that the slaves wanted to be free, which was not a common sentiment among white Southerners. The generals decided not to forward the message to Confederate President Jefferson Davis. However, one of Cleborne's associates was so indignant that he decided to inform the president directly. Davis, however, decided that the proposal was best kept suppressed, since he had no way of convincing Southern governors to emancipate their slaves. Robert E. Lee himself would write, quote, The chief source of information to our enemy comes through our Negroes, close quote. So he knows that all of these African Americans that are with his army, he knows that they're providing information to the Union. In fact, he would later write in January of 1865 that if we expect the Negroes to come in, and fight with us as soldiers because Robert E. Lee does support legislation that would, uh, that would bring African Americans in as, as soldiers. And he writes to a Confederate senator and he says that if we expect them to fight for us, we must offer them emancipation. General Claiborne failed to advance his ambition and unlikely plan, but the Confederate government would reconsider the proposal in the fall of 1864 in the face of William Tecumseh Sherman's destructive march through Georgia and conquering of South Carolina, Abraham Lincoln's re-election, and growing desertion from the army. Although none of these proposals came to fruition, it would be a mistake to ignore the significant contributions of African Americans in the Confederate war effort. The hard work of sustaining the South during the war fell disproportionately upon enslaved African Americans. This source of unpaid labor proved extremely valuable to the Confederates. The Confederacy, the rebel states, have mostly slave labor. And those enslaved persons go to work for the military complex of the Confederacy. And they perform a number of essential military related duties. And they're in every part of the Confederate war effort, whether we're talking about the Confederate Navy, whether we're talking about the Confederate Army, African Americans are playing what we would call combat service support roles in the modern vernacular. This means that they are performing those duties which serve the combat arms teams, the infantry, the artillery, the cavalry. They're performing those duties that make it possible for them to be in combat. In Nashville, a company of free blacks offered their services to the Confederate government, and in June 1861, the state legislature authorized the governor of Tennessee to accept into service all male persons of color. In Memphis, in September, a procession of several hundred free blacks marched through the streets under the command of Confederate officers. All over the South, there were African Americans who responded to the news of war by making public demonstrations of their support of the Confederacy. In April 1861, the Louisiana Native Guards, an African American militia regiment of 1,400 men and officers, offered their services to Dixie in past review in New Orleans. The next year, 3,000 blacks organized as the first Native Guard for the protection of the city 
and were described as rebel Negroes in the local newspaper. Many Southern soldiers brought slaves with them into the army as personal servants, especially in the war's earlier stages. They used the term soldier loosely. They'll take a bodyguard or a body servant and say, well, really, he was a soldier since he went to battle with him. Uh, they'll take a, a photograph where he actually had a musket, and they'll say, okay, really, he, he was a soldier because they gave him a musket. No, musket. No, that's not true. The loyalty of some of these slaves became a source of unique pride to white officers. Thousands of slaves follow their masters. A Missourian boasted, be they in the ranks or at the head of armies, through the dangers of the battlefield, and many have laid down their lives as proof of their love for their masters. But while many Southerners would continue to perpetuate the myth of the loyal slave, it was the enslaved's overwhelming desire for freedom that caused the Confederacy to even entertain an idea as desperate as emancipation for the purposes of military conscription. Alan Pinkerton, the founder of the Secret Service, the head of Lincoln's Secret Service, our intelligence agency, in the first 18 months of the war, he would note that it was from those African Americans who were employed in a military capacity that he got most of his information. So they become key spies, especially after the Emancipation Proclamation.